Good morning, good morning to all of you this morning. God bless you. I am so glad that you have joined us on this Sunday morning. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise you. We give you glory and honor for this time. We ask that this time is sanctified, set apart for your glory and for the edification of your people. Oh God, we thank you and praise you now that this word that will come forth this morning will edify, will build up, oh Lord God, will give grace to the hearers. And we thank you, Lord God, that in it all, you will be glorified. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I'm Pastor Ron Taylor here at Arise Christian Center, and I'm just glad to bring a word to you this morning. I want to thank all of you that constantly tune in to us on each and every Sunday morning. We are praying for you, and we thank God for you. On last Sunday, we celebrated Mother's Day. What an awesome time it was. The places were crowded. The places were full. And it is well deserved. We appreciate all of the mothers. But let me put a little plug in. Father's Day is coming up next month. And let's honor the fathers as well. Amen. Praise God. I just thought I'd slide that little plug in for the fathers. Let's make our faith declaration. And we're going to get right into the word of the Lord this morning. I want you to remain with me after the message. I want to pray with you and share a couple of things with you. So remain with me just for a few minutes after the message. Let's make our faith declaration so that we may get into this word. Thank you, Lord. By the word of God, I will think right. I will talk right. I will walk right. I will live right. How are we going to do it, my brothers and sisters? By the word of God, I will think right. I will talk right. I will walk right. I will live right. Spirit of the living God, move. Have your way. In the homes of the people, here in the sanctuary, have your way, Holy Spirit. Teach, build up, strengthen, correct. Whatever that needs to be done, we thank you that your word shall do it and not return to you void. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, today I am concluding a teaching entitled Walking in the power of his resurrection. We have been on this teaching today, March the 8th week, and I have been addressing the mind of Christ that empowers the believer to walk in his resurrecting power. That power that dwells on the inside of each believer, what mindset should we have that this power may flow? that it may manifest in our lives. What was the mindset of Christ? When Christ said in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 16, down through verse 18, when he said in verse 18, that I have power to lay my life down and I have power to take it up again. What was the mindset there that allowed Christ to walk in this kind of power? Because what the mindset of Christ was must also be our mindset that we may walk in this power. Power to lay, lay it down and power to take it up again. Revive things. Restore things. Refresh things. It requires a certain mindset. And that power will flow in our lives when we are operating in this particular mindset and in this spirit. 
seven things I share with you in regards to walking in this power. One, walk in love and compassion toward all people. Two, walk in a spirit of unity, avoiding division. Three, walk in a spirit of willing obedience to the will of God. Four, walk in a spirit of humility. Five, walk in a spirit of commitment to divine callings and assignments. Six, walk in a spirit of offering up pleasing and acceptable sacrifices to God. And seven, walk in a spirit of knowing that resurrecting life stems from death. Those were the seven characteristics of the mindset that empowers us to walk in resurrecting power. Then I began to share characteristics about walking in this power when he said to take up my life again. What was his mindset there? Because we need to have that mindset as well. And the first characteristic that reflect the mind of Christ uh, in regards to walking in this power was hold on to hope. Keep hope alive. Yes, hold on to hope. Keep hope alive. Why? It's not over. There's hope. It is not over for you. Praise be to God. We must keep hope alive. And I've shared scripture references. Uh, we will not go back through all of those for uh, uh, sake of time. But you can go and listen to those. But we must keep hope alive. When Jesus died on the cross and was buried, Many of his followers lost hope and they became scattered and weak and hiding out. But when he rose from the dead, when he was raised from the dead, their hope was rebirthed. It was restored. It was refreshed. And they went on to do great and mighty things in the early church and in the book of Acts. And that same thing works for us. We can go on to do great and mighty things, but we must first hold on to hope. Keep hope alive. Today, I'm going to share with you two more characteristics of the proper mindset that we should have so that the power of God can flow in our lives. So that the power of God can manifest in our lives. We can see that power flowing. We can see the results of that power flowing in our lives. But it requires the mind of Christ. A particular mindset. The first one again was we must keep hope alive. The second one that we're picking up on today is that we must know that we have been freed from the bondage of sin. Yes, we must know. I'm not talking about knowing of it. We must know that we have been freed from the bondage of sin. Many believers know of this. Through Christ, I've been freed. But I'm talking about knowing in your know that you have been freed from the bondage of sin. Why is it so crucial? Why is it so important? Because of a guilt conscience. A guilty conscience. I'm not speaking of conviction. I'm speaking of a guilty conscience. And when we have that guilty conscience of sin, then it weakens our power. It steals from the power of God flowing in and through our lives. 
We don't even attempt certain things because of a guilty conscience. The Bible tells us the impact that sin has on power. And in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, it tells us that the iniquities of the people separated them from God. And their sins caused God's face to be hidden from them that he did not hear. So yes, sin did have an impact on the power of God flowing in our lives, but God, hallelujah, but God, always like the but in the scriptures. But through Christ, we have been freed from the bondage of sin. Somebody ought to lift their hands right where you are and give God some praise. Through Christ, we have been delivered from the bondage of sin. I really want to bring this home because we must have an understanding of it if we're going to flow in this resurrecting power. Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 14, we're going to get it deep down in our spirit. We're going to get it in our knower that we know we have been free from the bondage of sin. Beginning at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under Law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey? Whether of sin leading to death, are of obedience leading to righteousness. But God, be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. To which you were delivered. And then verse 18. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God that you were delivered from being a slave of sin or in bondage to sin to becoming a slave of righteousness. Let's go back and look at this verse by verse because we really need to get this understanding so that the power of God can flow in our lives. Verse 14 starts out with saying, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not rule over you. Sin shall not control you. Shall not have dominion over you. How is that? One, because Christ's resurrection is at work in you. And it is greater than the power of sin. Let me say that again. That one of the reasons why sin does not have dominion over you is because Christ's resurrection is at work in you and it is greater than the power of sin. Now you may understand it in the way that John, the gospel writer said it, but he said this over in the book of first John chapter four. This is how he writes it. And he says in first John chapter four and verse four, he simply says this, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In other words, the greater one dwells on the inside of you. 
The greater one dwells on the inside of you. And that greater one that dwells on the inside of you is greater than the power of sin. Now it says in verse 14 here, it says, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now this brings more emphasis to the point that you shall not be under the dominion of sin. See, sin is strengthened by the law. The law is what brought sin to our knowledge. So sin is strengthened by the law. You find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 56 and 57. Sin is strengthened by the law. But you are not under law. You are under grace. Hallelujah. We are under grace. Thank God for grace. Now, I want you to see that grace is more powerful than sin. Yes, grace is more powerful than sin. Go to Romans chapter 5. Just one chapter over. Look in Romans chapter 5. And I want to show you in Scripture that grace carries more power than sin. Beginning at verse 20. And it reads, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. See again, like I said, sin is strengthened by the law. So the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Oh, that's good news. Hallelujah. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life. Through who? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the scripture tells us that grace carries more power than sin. And we are not under the law, but we are under grace. So some may say, well, because I'm under grace, you know, I can sin. It's okay. Everything is all right. But verse 15 brings clarity to that. Look what it says in verse 15, so that we stay on track. Why? We want the power of God to flow in our lives and through our lives. So verse 15 keeps us on track. And he says in verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? And the answer is certainly not. Certainly not. Because we find now that grace does not give us a green light to sin. But to the contrary, grace provides freedom from sin and from the eternal consequences of it. See, grace provides a freedom from sin. It doesn't give us a green light to sin. Thank God for grace. Thank God for grace. We are under grace, not the law. And then verse 16 goes on to say, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? See, so whomever we present ourselves to obey, we are slaves to the one whom we obey. 
whether it be sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. And then verse 17, it just empowers us. But God, hallelujah, but God be thanked. See, we have to give thanks to God for this. Grace is all from God. It's not of us, it's of God. But thanks, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin. See, we were slaves of sin, but thanks be to God because we obey from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. In other words, we obey that doctrine of righteousness and we were delivered from the bondage of sin. Hallelujah. And look what it goes on to say in verse 18. It says, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You became slaves of righteousness. See, you became slaves of righteousness because you have been set free from the slaves of sin. My God. My God. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. You have been delivered. You have been set free. Now, one may say, well, what about I still have sin in my life? I want you to understand it is saying that sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not rule over you. Sin shall not control you. Why? Because you are slaves of righteousness. But as thanks be to God, it is by his mercy, it is by his grace that we give thanks to God. So it's not talking about being free from all sin. It is talking about by the grace of God, sin no longer has dominion over you. You are no longer in bondage to sin. It shall not rule over you anymore. It doesn't have dominion. And it caps it off in verse 22 by saying it again. But now, somebody say now. Come on, say it again, now. But now. Having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No longer in bondage to sin, but free from the dominion of sin. And slaves unto God. And now fruit to holiness. And eternal life. Everlasting life. Grace has more power than sin. His grace is sufficient for you. We don't have to stay in a place of guilt and condemnation. When we miss the mark, when we fall short, we don't have to stay in that place and allow the guilt, the conscience, and the condemnation and sin to beat us up and to keep us in that place. But we need to know that it no longer has dominion over us and that we can revive and that we can be restored. And then when we repent, we can be cleansed of all unrighteousness. Yes, there's another level of power that we can operate in when we are not held in bondage to where we miss the mark. We really need to get this, saints, because I see too many saints that are not walking in the power of God. 
because you're too tied up with where you may have missed the mark. No, by the grace of God, we were slaves of sin. But now we are slaves of righteousness, a slaves to God. Now, this is where we struggle at. This is where most of us struggle. That's why it's so important to know that you have been freed from the bondage of sin. It's the conscience that causes us to struggle. And I'm not speaking of conviction. The Holy Spirit will convict you when you miss the mark. I'm talking about guilt. I'm talking about condemnation that comes from the other camp and keeps us from flowing in the power of God because we feel that we're not adequate. We're not worthy. We're undeserving. We are nothing. Now, those are lies from the enemy. It's from a different camp. We need to know that we have been free. And it no longer has dominion over us. This will allow the power of God to flow in our lives on another whole level, my friends. Listen to this good news. Go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 20. And it says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Oh, that's good news. And he knows all things. Read it again, verse 20. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Ah, my, my, my. That is so true. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. In other words, we have a confidence to move in the power of God, to flow in the power of God when our heart does not condemn us. And we find this example now with Elijah on Mount Carmel. When Elijah was not condemned in his heart, he was on Mount Carmel with plenty of faith and flowing in the power to call down fire from heaven. Why? He had confidence toward God because his heart did not condemn him. He was alone there with 450 prophets of Baal. Yet his heart was full of faith. It did not have condemnation and he flowed in a power called down fire from heaven, shut up the heavens from, from rain for three and a half years. Why? He had confidence toward God. His heart did not condemn him. But the moment that his heart condemned him from the threat that he received from Jezebel, the boy took off running for his life. His heart condemned him. And that's what happens to us. Our heart condemns us. And then we don't have confidence toward God. We don't understand. We don't even uh, uh, begin to think about the power that we can flow in. Because our heart has condemned us. But I want you to get this. I said I want you to get this. If your heart does not condemn you. Your heart does not condemn you, there's a power. There are possibilities. There's potential that you will begin to seek to flow in 
when your heart does not condemn you. Let me give you this from Romans chapter 8. Somebody's being helped today. Somebody's being strengthened today. The chains are coming off today. The chains are being broken today. And you are going to flow in another level of power. Look what it says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ who walk according to the Spirit. None. None. Stop allowing a guilty conscience to block the power of God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the Spirit. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is liberating news. This is liberating word. We want to flow in the power of God. But we got to get rid of this junk that keeps us from flowing in his power. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord God most high. Look what it says here now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you can't stop right there. That is not the end of the text. Continue on in verse 11. And such were some of you. And such was some of you. But, thank God for the but. But, hallelujah, you were washed, hallelujah. But you were sanctified or set apart. But you were justified, made righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Oh, give him praise. And it's saying, though we were slaves to sin, though we were some of these things, but by God, by his grace, and by what he did, you were washed, and sanctified, and justified by the Lord and by the Spirit of God. I want you to understand that you have been freed you have been delivered. Jesus spoke to the woman and he said to the woman, woman, thou art loose. Not that you will be loose, but thou art loosed. And I'm speaking to you today. And I'm saying to you today, you are free. You have been freed from the bondage of sin. And when you understand that truth, and when you begin to walk in that truth, there's another level of power that you will walk on. Another level. Praise God. Glory be to God. So get it, my brothers and sisters. Hear me this morning or hear the word of the Lord coming through me. You are freed from the bondage of sin. Walk in this truth and you are walking another level of power. 
real quickly, real quickly, let me give you the final characteristic or mindset that allows this power to flow in our lives. Now, before we go into this last one, the Bible reminds us and it tells us in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 that we are not to entangle ourselves again to a yoke of bondage. We have been free from the bondage of sin. The chains have been broken. But we are not to entangle ourselves again with a yoke of bondage. Yes, you have been washed. You have been sanctified. You have been justified through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will allow you to operate on another level of power. Now, the final mindset, final characteristic that reflects the mind of Christ or the mind that we should be walking in for this power to flow is this. Knowing that Christ is the author and the finisher of your faith. Knowing that Christ is the author and the finisher of your faith. It's important to know it. Not to just know of it, but to know it. Not only is he the author, but he's the finisher of your faith. See, whenever it comes to resurrecting power that we're speaking of walking in, we must always remember that it's tied to Christ. It's tied to Christ. It's not separate of Christ. It's tied to Christ. Jesus said this to Martha when he showed up regarding Lazarus' death. He says, I am the resurrection. Jesus said this to his disciples after he had risen from the dead. He said in Matthew 28 that all authority that is right and power has been given unto me. See? So Jesus is tied to resurrecting power. It's all through him. It's all about him. It is said in the book of Colossians that all things were created through him and for him. And by him all things consist. For he is to have the preeminence in all things or first place in all things. So he is the author and the finisher of our faith. That is found in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Not only is he the originator of our faith, the pioneer of our faith, the founder of our faith, but he is also the finisher of our faith, the perfecter of our faith, the completer of our faith. Why is this so important when we talk about walking in the power? Because there are some who started well and got knocked off track. And now you don't think you can flow in that power. But he's the also the finisher of our faith. Philippians 1, verse 6 and 7 says it like this. For he who begun the good work in you will complete it. For he who begun the good work in you will complete it. He is the completer of our faith. So when we talk about flowing in this power, we must understand that he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And in closing, let me give you this quick example. Peter. Peter, a disciple of Christ, started well following Christ. 
with Christ daily. But when Christ went to the cross, Peter denied him three times. And on the third time, even with cursing, he denied him. But God had begun to work in Peter. Now, after Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to Peter, Peter was restored. Peter is now finding out that Christ is not only the beginner of his faith or the author of his faith, but he was also the finisher of his faith. And when Christ came back to Peter and restored him, Peter was an awesome apostle. And Peter would preach, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2. And when he would finish preaching, hallelujah, it says 3,000 people got saved in one day with one message from Peter. And Peter one day, him and John, was going to the temple. And as they were going to the temple, a lame man was at the gate begging for alms. And Peter said to him, silver and gold I have none. But what I do have in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And reached out and took the lame man by the hand and raised him up. And the man began to dance and leap and shout and went into the temple leaping and dancing and shouting and praising God. What happened? Peter operated on another level of power because now Peter understood that Christ was not only the author of his faith, but Christ was also the finisher of his faith. And I say to you this morning, when you know that he's not only the beginner of your faith, but he's the finisher of your faith, you will begin to operate and another level of power. Because he's the finisher of your faith. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1. That it's going to be him that even receives the end of our faith. 1 Peter chapter 1. I believe is verse 9. He'll go, he's going to receive the end of our faith. He's the finisher. So what he has begun. He will complete it. See, we need to know this. We need to walk in that truth. So that when the challenges come, when the trials come, when the trouble comes, we're able to overcome. Because we know, like Peter did, that he's not only the author, he's also the finisher. And the Apostle Paul said, this is what kept me as a defender of the gospel. Out of all that I went through, it is because I was able to go through, because I understood that he was the author and the finisher of my faith. He's that to you. He's that to me. And when we walk in that truth, we walk on another level of power. Praise be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Magnify him. Extol him. Exalt him. He'll finish what he started. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I pray that this teaching has really been a blessing unto you. But there may be someone this morning that is listening to this message and you have never made Jesus Christ your personal Savior. Today is your day. Right now is your moment to accept Christ as your personal Savior. This is how you walk in this power. It begins with him. It begins with him. How do you do it? You simply believe in your heart and confess with your mouth 
that Christ died for you and rose again. Repeat this after me. If you desire to be saved, to be uh, born again, or to accept Christ as your personal Savior, repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. You rose again. And I accept you now as my personal Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. That prayer brought you into the family of God. <laughs> yes, welcome to the family of God. God bless you. And if you would like to know what are some of the things that you can do to further your walk with the Lord, we'll be glad to share some things with you. Stay tuned to these teachings. It's going to strengthen you. It's going to build your faith. So stay tuned to these teachings. But if you have anything else that we can help you with, feel free to contact us. All of our information is found on our website, arisechristiancenter.com. That is arisechristiancenter.com. You can contact us and we'll be glad to share with you some things that will be a blessing to you in your further walk with the Lord. God keep you. God bless you. And now I want you to remain with me just for a couple of moments that I may pray for you. And then we are going to close out today. I want to pray over your finances. I want to believe God with you that your finances will be stronger, that your finances will increase. God wants you to have your needs met. Not some, all. That's the will of God. He says, I will supply all your need according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. All your need, not some. He said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God don't want you to have lack as him being your shepherd. He wants to take care of your lack. And I want to come into agreement with you that this will take place in your life, in your business, in your household, in your family. Whatever it is, we want to trust God and believe God. Let me pray now over your finances. Let's release our faith. Father God, we thank you and we praise you that your people will be obedient to your word. That they know that you take pleasure in the prosperity of your servants. So now I pray that they will prosper, that they will increase. And Lord God, you also give us a word on how to prosper, on how to increase. And I pray that they would be obedient to that word. So, and a harvest will come forth. Give, and it shall be given. Trust God as your provider, because that is who he is, your provider. So right now, I come into agreement with all of those who would be obedient to the word of God and be increased in their finances and prosper in all the things they put their hands to. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Increase is coming your way if you will obey the word of the Lord. I'm in agreement with you. Increase is coming your way in the name of Jesus. Let me take this opportunity to thank all of those who sow into this ministry, who give to this ministry. We appreciate you. 
We thank God for you. Hallelujah. And his work and his word is going forth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like to sow a seed into this ministry, again, our information is on our website. You can mail it in. You can drop it off at our physical address. You can PayPal it in or you can text it in. The information is there. We thank you again. May God bless you. May God keep you. This is Pastor Ron Taylor here at Arise Christian Center, where we are encouraging you to go higher in the things of God. God bless you.